Hey there, this is Cass. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a screen cap redraw of one of my favorite shows. Um, this is going to be a very spoiler filled video because I'm going to be talking about Ruby Volume 8. In fact, uh, the screen cap that I'm going to be referencing is something from Ruby Volume 8. So if you have not seen the latest few episodes, uh, don't look here. Go somewhere else. Watch the episodes even. It's a really good season. And then come back and watch my video. Um, anyway, let's get into it. I was so incredibly happy with so many things uh, that the Kruby have been doing in this current season. Uh, volume 8 lives rent-free in my head, and especially scenes like the one I'm drawing where um, Penny and Nora and Ruby are sharing a really emotional moment. The character development in this scene and all through this season have been so amazing. I really enjoy how this season especially they have sort of taken the uh, focus off of Team Ruby. Not entirely, obviously, but I really love that Nora and Ren and Jean and the Aesops and all these other characters have gotten their chance to shine, especially Penny, um, and that we've gotten to see a lot of emotional growth from all of them. Especially Nora. Oh my gosh, I did not realize how much I loved this girl until this season. I always thought that she was incredibly funny and that she was super kind and I loved that she was sort of the emotional center of Team Juniper back in the original seasons. Um, but seeing her get so much good character development, just really, really solid, awesome character development this season has made me absolutely fall in love with her. And I think that in a lot of ways, she sort of represents something that we all can feel, that we are not out of place, but that we are the ones who do the simple things, and that there isn't much more to us beyond that. While, in truth, other people see us as amazing, multifaceted people who are always kind or there to help, and we do all these amazing things. Uh, she represents kind of a very specific type of insecurity that I actually feel like I have, and I really love her because of that, um, because she is able to overcome it so well. As a whole, there is something that I want to talk about in this video that Ruby really focuses on um, that I've always really loved because it's something that I also really focus on in all of my original works as well, and that's fairy tales. Every character in Ruby, or most main characters in Ruby, and a lot of side characters in Ruby, are all based around different folklore and fairy tales and putting a spin on them, which is something that I really love. I've loved fairy tales since I was very young, and I normally write fairy tales as a major inspiration for any of my own stories. For those of you who don't know, I have a comic that is currently on hiatus because the COVID stuff has sort of screwed up my work schedule a little bit um, and my ability to work on those things, but I have an original comic called Waystones that is very heavily based in fairy tales and folklore, and a lot of my original characters as well are also inspired by characters from things like fairy tales. We see this used a lot in Ruby as sort of a device that we see the characters through and through their stories. Some are clearly more obvious than others. Um, we have Ruby, who is very obviously Little Red Riding Hood. We have Cinder, who is a very cool interpretation of Cinderella. And uh, if you haven't seen the episode that goes into Cinder's backstory yet, I again question why you're watching this video after I told you you needed to watch all of season eight. But wow, that episode was just so amazing and added so much to her character. That really blew my mind. I really love seeing a villain who became the villain because they were sort of beaten down and taught that there could be nothing more to them. And now Cinder is just this person who is driven by her will to survive. I think that that's an incredibly interesting way to twist the story of Cinderella into having her be a villain. Um, I obviously don't think that it redeems Cinder on its own in any way, but I think it makes her character very interesting. And also, in a lot of ways, and I'm not going to go too much into this because I don't want to have to add trigger warnings to this video, but I think it is a very interesting way to also put into the lens of what 
being abused can do to a person. Back a little bit more on topic of fairy tales in general, I think I want to just share a few of my favorite fairy tales with all of you and talk about their stories and uh, maybe one day I'll even design my own versions of them. So the first story that I'm going to talk about is one of my favorites from when I was young. Uh, it is also sort of an example of how, depending on who writes the stories, um, and who sort of weaves the story of the folk tales of the time, uh, you get a certain perspective on how honest people were about their governmental situation. I think with most fairy tales you do have to have some sort of suspension of disbelief, especially when you look at our current world state. Um, but one of my favorite fairy tales is The Prince and the Pauper. The story of The Prince and the Pauper is about two young boys who were born on the exact same day and by coincidence happen to look very similar. One of them was born into a pauper's house. He was incredibly poor and had no money and was forced to be a beggar all of his life. The other was born the son of the king and obviously became the crown prince. One day when the beggar was out wandering, he stumbles upon the gates of the palace and tries to sneak in because he wants to see what it's like. He's caught by the guards, but the prince sees this happen and is curious about him and tells the guards to leave him alone. The two boys get to talking and they eventually decide that they're very curious about each other's lives. The prince wants to know what it's like to be in the outside world and be a normal person, while the pauper wants to know what it's like to have things that a prince would have and experience all the finery that being a prince provides. So they switch places. And I think this story is my favorite or one of my favorites because it sort of speaks to how people always look for things on the other side that are nicer. It's like the phrase, the grass is always greener. I actually do have two characters uh, that I did base off of this story. Um, they're both girls. One of them is a would-be monarch uh, who has absolutely no interest in her throne at all. And the other is this sort of upstart rebel girl who has all of the knowledge that she wants to have and all of the drive that she wants to have to be able to help people but because of the way the world is in the story um, anyone who is born poor is pretty much stuck being that way for the rest of their life and they will never gain power um, so these two decide well wait what if we swapped places because you have no interest in being a monarch and I have every interest in trying to help the world change, so let's do that and then I can take care of things and it gets very chaotic and things definitely don't go as planned for either of them. I have a couple of twists on the initial story and uh, if you ever want, maybe I'll make a video detailing that sometime. Uh, the second fairy tale that I absolutely love um, is probably one of the better known, I don't even know if it would be considered a fairy tale at this point, um, it's just a story that a lot of people really enjoy, is um, I really love Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I grew up watching the very creepy movie that Disney made of Alice in Wonderland, and now there have also been multiple remakes of it. But uh, Alice in Wonderland is very special to me because it actually permeates uh, the D&D &D campaign that I DM for. Um, for anyone who doesn't know anything about Alice in Wonderland, I wonder what rock you've been living under for the past however many years, but um, it's the story of a girl who essentially goes into a magical world through a hole in the ground, and it's a very trippy, psychedelic sort of story of following Alice into Wonderland and seeing all of the things that she sees and it's all about a critique on being an adult and what it is like to be a child and what it is like to experience imagination in a different way. It's it's a very oddly dark story in the original telling, but it, it's a very interesting one. The way that one of my very, very best friend's characters, uh, his name is Joe, his character's name is Ashrin in our campaign, I have sort of molded 
that character's story in the campaign to feel very Alice in Wonderland-ish. So Ashrin is an elf and she is from the Feywilds. And in my campaign, because my campaign is a homebrew one, my entire Feywild setting is based off of Alice in Wonderland. In fact, the way that my players found their way into the Feywilds for the first time in the campaign was following a white rabbit and essentially jumping down a hole in the ground. But I actually have a lot of plans for things in that campaign to continue the Alice in Wonderland theme um, that I've been writing a lot of notes on. Um, and if you guys want, um, I have a video that's going to hopefully be coming out, uh, provided that I didn't completely scrap the footage of one of the major villains from my campaign. Her name is Dinah, and I got to redesign her from her original design, and I'm going to hopefully talk about all of that more then. But Alice in Wonderland is very neat. Uh, she goes down this rabbit hole and then <laughs> sort of finds herself in a very magical, mystical, terrifying land that she has no idea what to do with. Once she is in Wonderland, she finds herself sort of as a metaphor for growing up and feeling stuck between growing up and staying a child and what it sort of feels like to go through becoming an adult. She starts changing her size and just can't feel like she fits in the rooms that she's in. She drinks these uh, potions that are sitting up on a table to make herself bigger or smaller, and at one point she makes herself so big that the house explodes. It's actually really neat because uh, in Ruby very recently, Oscar started talking about Alice in Wonderland, which absolutely made me and all of my friends lose our minds because he mentions, uh, I believe what they call it in the show is the girl who fell through the world and how when she comes back to her home world, she's very sad and Oscar mentions that it's because she's a very different person than what she used to be. And I think that is going to be a very major point of symbolism for the rest of Volume 8, uh, which is honestly a little bit terrifying. I think that especially with some of the symbolism that we see in the Volume 8 opening song, we already see some Alice in Wonderland parallels, uh, especially with when the floor breaks out from under Team Ruby and they all fall into this darkness and then you see the apathy hands reaching up around them. Uh, I think that's going to be a very major point of comparison to Alice in Wonderland at some point. I am very, very excited to see what the new season will bring. That's it for this video. Uh, I haven't ever done these talk over videos before, so I apologize if it's a little bit rambly. If you would like to see more stuff like this, uh, please leave a like and maybe consider commenting down below. Tell me what your favorite fairy tale is. I would love to see. Um, and maybe you guys can give me some new reading material in the process. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great morning, noon, or night, whatever it is for you, and I'll see you next time.